my name is Megan Pleasanton and I'm the coordinator of the Kent County Master Gardeners and your workshop today is all about pole lima beans. Um, today our presenter is uh, Mr. John Clinton Daniel. He has been working at Delaware State University Cooperative Extension for 20 years and he is currently serving as the farm management specialist and ag program leader. So uh, thank you so much John for being with us today and um, we're looking forward to it. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. So, yes, Megan mentioned, uh, yeah, I have 20 years in at Delaware State University uh, in Cooperative Extension, and I've worked with Bold Beans uh, several of those years. So we have uh, done some research projects with them uh, over time. We've also had uh, a few of, uh, you know, personal times where I've grown them uh, at other locations as well. So. Uh, thanks everyone for joining and here we go. So lima beans, the pole lima beans are a little bit different than the, uh, the bush lima beans are the ones you'd expect uh, to see at the grocery store. Uh, they're certainly valued uh, much higher in price. They're a lot more labor, uh, but some of the options you can do uh, on trellis with whole beans, there's baby limas. Uh, we did those once and we found that they were very prolific. Uh, there was an awful lot of uh, harvesting that had to happen and they're very small and it's a lot of shelling and a lot of effort. So one and done, uh, I'm not gonna, you know, say I was a fan uh, that they tasted great, but I was not a fan of all the extra effort that went into the harvest and shelling of baby limas uh, on pole beans. So I'll let that happen in the field and I'll just pick those up in the bag in the grocery store. Uh, medium size, a lot of people here are king of the garden. They're available everywhere. Um, and then the larger beans, the, the Dr. Martins, the prize takers, different ones like that, uh, usually you have to buy locally. So you can get them a lot of times at your local hardware store, your local uh, seed stores like Clark Seeds in Kent County and different ones will have them, they'll be pricey. Uh, some people will sell them directly. Uh, you, if you look, people have those available either in plants or in the seed uh, options, but buyer beware, Dr. Martin's officially isn't produced anymore. It's actually from Pennsylvania, um, you know, developed by uh, Dr. Martin. And those seeds are not, you know, still being processed for any kind of uh, commercial use or any kind of uh, large quantity sa uh, seed sales. So you, you have to sort of hope for the best when you buy them, but uh, a lot of times, you know, it, it'll be slightly hybrid, but it'll still be a good uh, large bean, four or five uh, beans in a pod kind of style. And then for those who like a little something different, there's the red speckles out there. Christmas is one we've grown. Uh, it it kind of freaks out, uh, you know, the loyal whole bean, uh, you know, consumers because they turn purple. They kind of are red speckled a little bit and they, they look kind of green with a little white in them, but when you cook them, they turn purple. Uh, I'll give you an example. My dad freaked out and thought they were the bad ones that he picked out and said, I don't know what you guys are doing in the research, but you know, some of these are no good. They turn purple. It just made me laugh, but it was uh, you know these red speckles, which are great if you can get like a restaurant or something looking for a little color, uh, something different on a plate, then they would work. Or if you were looking to have something a little different uh, for you know your Thanksgiving dinner and like, so the problem with pole beans usually is not only just the labor, but it's also the cost to set up. So it's a lot, a lot of things, there is a lot of capital cost involved um, and the material prices are going up because if you were buying uh, poles or four by fours, doesn't matter any lumber right now, prices are pretty high uh, and it'd be hard to nail down a price next week versus this week. But um, just to give you a ballpark idea, this is per acre. Uh, but, you know, you're going to need to put in poles, you need, you know, uh, you, it works real nice to have plastic, it's not required, uh, but it reduces your labor and weeding. Drip tape, you don't want to overhead spray uh, pole beans, there's a lot of issues that can come about that, we'll talk about that in a minute, but, uh, and then bamboo is a cheaper version for a middle support for netting and trellises uh, to hold your uh, top wire, but you also will need top wire um, support uh, crank tighteners on the ends and, and some other things to the mix. Uh, you know, they, you got to make sure your soil is proper. So you might need lime, you might need, you're probably going to need some sort of, um, 
you know, pre-plant fertilizer in the mix. Uh, fertigation is another option in the mix if you were going to put it through the irrigation. Uh, pesticide and fungicides uh, could be an option, depends on the year and what we're battling. And then of course, you're gonna have to be able to prep the fields and, and you're gonna either have to mow or till the centers and all that. So uh, all that's in the mix and there is a cost to everything that happens. Uh, it'll end up looking like this. Um, that's the setup we did on the farm, uh, which was the, the poles. We used bamboo in between, poles were at 20 feet, bamboo was at 10. We put down uh, plastic, black plastic mulch. Some people like red, some people like white. Um, it just depends. The black draws heat, so you can get them started earlier. The problem is in the summer when you're trying to reduce heat, the black is also drawing heat, so it, it creates a slight problem. Uh, for you in heat buildup. But, uh, you know, they like a raised bed or a hill. So if you just kind of, you know, if you're transplanting a plant on your own, you can do that. Uh, but, you know, you want to water underneath to reduce your fungal issues. Uh, and then a trellis, we, we kind of like a netting uh, that there's the tre trellis netting. It works really nice, uh, a lot less effort, but you can still use twine uh, in the mix without a question. So seeds or, and or plants. Uh, so if you start seeds, you know, it, it's a, something that you could start on your own, save you a couple weeks in it, you know, to get them started. Uh, but they need to have a, a warm place uh, that, that you can have some light control. So if you put them in say your basement, cause it's convenient, you would have to have some lights and grow lights or some sort of light to mimic that it's, you know, uh, longer days so that they will grow. Uh, but once the runners start to put out and start putting shoots on about a foot long or so, you need to move them out to get them to harden, which basically just introduce them to some colder probably nights uh, and some air temperatures and stuff. And then you want the ground to be at least 55 degrees. Um, that's because otherwise it will just sit and kind of stall and that delay. So all that you increased in time to get them the plant started, you're gonna lose some of it because if the ground's too cold, it just kind of sit dormant. Um, same thing happens if you direct seed. So basically you need that ground temperature up. Otherwise you won't have the vigor of the seed to get started. Um, you know, so when you plant, I'm gonna just move this right over here. Um, so anyway, you need to plant them. So the curved part of the bean, I actually should have thrown a picture in the mix, uh, but when you're looking at it, the cotyledon is uh, on the back side and, and it has sort of what looks like a, where it was plucked from the pod, that needs to go down when you're planting. Um, it reduces how much the plant has to kind of recorrect itself when it, when it comes out of the large side. So we just want to you know, make sure you plant them. Uh, no more than, than a couple, three inches, a couple inches deep is plenty. Uh, and then you want to make them sort of in a hill or a row, row so that you get your best um, results for getting those uh, growing and started. Soil requirements. So this is a, a you know, a full sun uh, plant. So you want to make sure this is something that can access, you know, sun. So if you're thinking about where to set your plot up and what you're going to do, uh, don't put it in the shadiest spot. Uh, a little shade's okay, but I mean, you wouldn't want to have it completely under uh, without, you know, any sun connecting to it. Um, it has, you know, you want your pH to be 5.5 up to 6.8. And I can tell you if it gets outside of that range, if it's, it's too acidic or it's too basic, it will not grow very well. Um, I can give an example, you know, there's a farm that Planted and as they were liming, they overlimed an area um, and then they skipped an area and it became one area was, was sort of acidic, the other one was too basic, and neither row, they put about 10 feet between the rows, neither row did well. And then when we checked, it actually was just a happened to happen exactly in that spot to ruin both setups because one was way too basic and one was too acidic. But long, you know, they have a pretty tolerant range, uh, like most vegetables, but they do like in the middle. They, once you get outside of that zone, they will not do well. Uh, they do have a tolerance uh, of a little bit of salinity. Say if you are closer to the uh, shore, you would, you know, Excellent. but not too close to the shore. 
and of course they self pollinate. Um, so you want to have where zero, you can zero, uh, zero, get um, that uh, so the airflow can get and through. And, and can get through. Yes. Awesome. If you can yourself, uh, Jim, yours is not muted. It's it's kind of playing out here for us. So anyway, when it's time to plant, um, you'll have the to make sure that you have your trellis in one form or another, whether it's through netting or whether it's for the um, using twine uh, ready to go. Because once you have that either growing from the ground from seed or transplants for sure, will need trained instantly. So you don't want to have to be trying to contend with that after you put them in the ground. Um, you know, and again, we talked about that temperature in the ground. They, they don't uh, want any kind of frost. So, you, you know, May 1st, June 15th, in that range, you want that ground temperature to be up a little bit. They'll see a lot faster vigor if they do. So that would be the range in which you would be expecting to plant them is somewhere in the May, early June. Spacing is important for pole lima beans. A lot of times when you read the packets, you know, it'll say base them every two feet to, or so on. What we found over time is for like King of the Gardens, I think they're asking a foot or two foot. You actually want to put those about three feet apart um, for your row spacing uh, down the row. And for like, if you want with a larger bean, like a Dr. Martin or a prize taker or, uh, you know, Big Mama or whatever other ones you were interested in, you go with four feet. Uh, as your spacing. And they will fill the trellis in uh, no problem whatsoever, and you'll have a, a very good crop. The problem when you put them too tight is you'll see tons of greenery, but not much fruit. So it's kind of risky. You're wasting the money on seed. You're putting all the effort in, and then they find that you're not getting much fruit and because it's competing for space and light and air and all those things that affect how well they produce. So you really do want to space those out a little bit further. And we've, we've even spaced them to five feet and the yield was not much different than, than four, but, um, but we definitely want to say, you know, around four, you can go a little bit wider even, but four feet. And we like to put spacing uh, between the rows to give enough room for air and sunlight to get in. So it's kind of one of those 10 foot spacing between rows is not, uh, more than you'd expect it, it really would be in the in the mix of you know that uh, 10 to 12 feet uh, between the rows so because because they're self-pollinating that wind going through there is important to help that process you also want to make sure that you're getting plenty of sunlight to reduce any of the fungal issues and stuff um, you need to make sure that your new seed slash plants get a, a drink so when you plant them just like everything else you'll give them some water maybe a little uh liquid fertilize, if you want to put it around the outside perimeter uh, when you're watering to, to give them a little drink uh, would be good to give them a boost. Um, but when you're transplanting, don't pick the most inopportune time for them, which would be a windy event. So if you see um, an extreme wind event coming on Thursday and, and you're looking to plant them, I wouldn't put them in the ground Wednesday or Thursday and then have them beaten and banged up uh, because it'll snap off their little runners and, and kind of stunt them. So uh, usually it'd be best to just wait an extra day or two to, to make sure that that's passed and, and you're good to go uh, move forward with that. So watering, uh, lima beans require average amount of water. Um, they do best under well-drained soil. So if you have a heavy clay soil, it may not be uh, the best for you because if it retains, you don't want wet feet of sorts. You don't want the, the crop to be sitting and the, the roots to be sitting in water. Uh, you want them to be able to, you know, get water as it benefits them. So you end up watering uh, regularly, uh, like a lot of the vegetable crops, but uh, during blooming and fruiting period, you, you want them to uh, continue to get water and continue to grow. Uh, it's one of those, you don't want tons and tons of foliage to take over. Uh, but you do want them to have, when they start blooming and, and putting on little pods, that's when you wanna make sure they have all the water they need. If, you're, if your lima bean plants uh, are allowed to dry out, they may drop their flowers and pods uh, completely. 
and uh, and slow fruiting all together. So another side of that is during the heat of the summer, if we start seeing large temperature spikes and it doesn't cool off at night, so it can be 90s during the day, as long as it gets below 80 at night, your crop will continue to grow and they will do great. The problem we've run into is when it continues to stay hot at night and it's over 80 degrees during the night and it's hot during the day, all of a sudden it'll start aborting those blossoms and aborting that fruit pod because it's trying to protect the plant. So that's when we see real issues. A little extra watering uh, helps a little bit but you know the plant feels stress and the first thing it does is drop the fruit options so that it can continue to grow. So fertilizing. Uh, so when we're looking at these, you know, we, we usually uh, band, uh, you know, one and a half, two pounds of a balanced fertilizer, uh, 20, 20, 20, 10, 10, 10 is okay too. Uh, for every uh, 100 feet of rows, we're gonna put that in and we place it off side or below deeper than where the actual seeds or transplants would go so we don't damage them. So you can burn them uh, with fertilize like most vegetable crops. So you want to make sure that you're, you're putting some fertilize for them to access, but you don't want to put it in the hole with them. You don't want it to be something that is uh, right there and aggressively uh, going to burn or hurt them. Uh, so after it gets started, once you, once you get them in the ground and started, you wouldn't want to be putting a bunch of nitrogen uh, to them. Again, they're legume, uh, they fix their own nitrogen. So uh, once they're up and growing, if you continue to fertilize them with uh, especially a nitrogen based, it will put on the prettiest green foliage you have ever seen. They will be so, you know, full green, beautiful, uh, but they will be limited fruit because what happens is It'll have so much foliage that you'll actually reduce the actual harvestable plant or uh, pods of fruit because of that extra nitrogen that it let the plants put on more than need be. So this is kind of what it looks like uh, when they're set up and running. So you see the poles, there's netting, there's the top wire, um, all holding that together and, and they've been trained through it. Training is a never ending battle. You can see in this picture where it has some runners that are just kind of hanging out in the wind and, and sitting there. What you do is when you're training, you train them up and then you train them back down and you train them around and sideways and all different ways so they can just fill in the gaps in that trellis area. And it'll be a never ending battle. Every time you kind of walk through checking for pests or checking for disease, you, you train, you go ahead and, and put those back in and tuck them in and let them wrap around uh, because they'll reach out. And if you're not far enough apart, um, this was probably set up at like eight feet and we ended up moving them a little further than that, but uh, they'll actually try to reach each other, you know, and, and, and throw runners every direction you can. So this is not, you know, a great practice to, to make it so they are just going everywhere they want to go. You want to tuck them back in, let them continue to wrap around the trellis and move through that. Um, you're going to have to deal with the center. So you either choose to till in this regard. Uh, some people will mow, so they will allow um, grass to grow and, and everything, and they'll just mow in between so that it's not muddy if it does rain uh, when they're in there harvesting. Either way is okay, um, but you just want to make sure that around the base, so whether you're using a plastic mulch or you're using a hoe, um, you keep the weeds away from the plants and in that row that they're actually planted. Uh, but between rows, you can get away with either one. And then of course, remember it's hand harvest. So you got to keep that in mind uh, for the labor of which you put in is, you know, you're going to definitely need, a, you know, quite a bit of effort to undo, get them harvested. So here is a fact sheet that it's available. I, I put it in the end of the uh, presentation for the link that you can get. Um, this is one that Megan helped me do when she was actually uh, a student and we put this together. It hasn't changed other than, you know, of course we have the brown uh, marmalade stink bug as well as a green stink bug, but uh, same differences in the mix. Uh, but we're, we're definitely concerned about pests. Stink bugs is one of them. Aphids is another. Aphids is a problem because of how fast they can 
uh, you know, build their population in there and they'll continue to damage the plants, uh, making the fruit mal uh, malformed that, that, and everything kind of not uh, feeling too good. Stink bugs are the, the, the most damaging to the fruit where they keep piercing because they have that, that piercing uh, feeding system. So they kind of pierce the fruit through the pods and then they just chew on a little bit and move on. So when you're looking at it, there's nothing from the outside other than a little bit of a ring that you can see that little dark spot here and there um, where they've been at. But when you open it, you're gonna see a disformed and damaged uh, pod that's gonna need tossed. Um, so they, they definitely are one of these ones. And of course, it's one of the only green things late in the fall. So stink bugs know to travel to pole bean plots because they're going to continue to grow up till frost and they are going to have some fruit and something to continue to eat. So you'll have to keep an eye on that. Um, Mexican bean beetles, another uh, one that's, that's, oh, let me just say this too, uh, for the stink bugs, uh, when you notice what looks to be a ladybug, which you think is a great bug, um, but it's black and white, uh, that's the wrong kind of bug. So that when you see those around, those aren't ladybugs, they're not going to be eating your aphids and helping you in any way. That's going to be a stink bug later in life. So you're gonna have to contend with that problem. Uh, bean beetles, same issues. Um, so it's another one that uh, it's a coppery brown beetle um, that looks a little like a ladybug. Um, again, not a ladybug. And uh, so you wanna make sure that you're contending with those because they will continue to damage the plants. And overall, it will become uh, a situation where they uh, don't, you know, the, as the plants continue to, to get hurt, uh, they have to sort of pull back on their production. So all these create a problem in, uh, in your production, which is the whole point you're growing them is so you have something to eat and maybe even something to sell. Uh, lab, spider mites, another one that damages the plants uh, and they can continue to uh, be a problem straight through. They're hard to see, that's the problem with them, but you can start seeing that the, you'll see this yellowing on the plant leaves and uh, stems and, and then you know that there's got to be some issues happening somewhere. If you have a magnifying glass, you can take a look and see them without a problem. So now that we've battled all the pests, we also have to battle disease. So as I mentioned before, it's way better to use drip irrigation or soaker hoses to water because as you continue to use overhead water, uh, it leaves opportunities, those wet leaves and, and certain conditions, especially when it's hot, to build fungal diseases uh, for the most part in these plants and it causes a problem. So, you know, you got leaf spot, which you see here, um, you know, these lesions, as they continue to damage the plant leaves, it reduces how much photosynthesis it can go through and it's going to reduce how much it can do. But these will spread to the pods uh, and making those uh, an issue for resale, considering this is one of those products you can sell shelled or unshelled. You can't have them uh, you know, looking in, in bad regards. Uh, Bina thracnose, here's another one uh, that does bad things to uh, more lesions and stuff to the fruit and the stems and the foliage. Uh, so, it, you know, you, you can't sell a lot of product that's been damaged. This particular one can hang out in soil up to two years, uh, and then it jumps out and, and sort of gets to your bean crop or other vegetable crops that you want to be uh, mindful of, you know, rotation. Usually we, we grow pole beans because of the, how much work it goes for putting the poles and everything in. We usually leaves them, leave them in sight for about five years, four to five years, and then rotate them somewhere else and go again. Now I have had some producers tell me they've been in the same spot for uh, many years and it's not been a problem, but I can tell you as you start to get fungal issues in the soil, it will become something that you will not be able to battle without rotating your location. So uh, bean root rot, another one uh, that is, you know, sort of attacks the, the young uh, plants and uh, you'll start seeing this 
uh, rust color uh, develop on the foliage and, and lower leaves. And if you pull it, you'll see that it's uh, uh, damaging the, the root base and the stems, and you will not be able to go too well uh, for a crop in that. Powdery mildew, another one uh, that's an issue because of the damage you see even right here. Um, so as it gets warmer and wetter, uh, these fungal issues will continue. Um, you know, powdery mildew can, you know, move to your, uh, your, any of your cucurbits, it'll go to cold beans, it'll go to a lot of things at a very quick rate. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, you end up with, uh, damage to the plant, which is problematic because of how much it'll produce, but also damage to the crop that you're harvesting and uh, the fruit will be no good. And that'll also uh, cost in the overall thing. So basically I'm saying, you know, you're going to have to spray, um, usually any copper base uh, fungicide works well, uh, but you wanna double check and make sure that the product you're using is uh, recommended for them. Uh, but if you just keep spacing done, uh, make sure there's plenty of room between the rows. So there's plenty of airflow through, uh, you know, you're not overhead watering. All those things will actually help you battle those diseases uh, basically without spraying anything. But if you start to notice anything at all, you have to be willing to spray, uh, especially the fungal issues. Uh, you may be able to squash some stink bugs and different things by hand, but you aren't going to be able to get ahead by pulling a couple of leaves because it will spread too fast. So you will need some sort of uh, fungicide spray to kind of help you deal with that. So harvesting, again, I mentioned before, um, it's a hand harvest situation. So you have to put your hands on them. You got to see, and I have had many people help me, uh, students as well as other staff and, and other people help me harvest and they just go along and they think they feel the pods and the pods are full and they just snap them off. So my recommendation to them and you is to kind of hold up some of those pods, look towards the sun and actually see the size of the bean. If you know that the bean's a medium sized bean, if it's full of tiny little dots in there, when you look at the sun, even if the pod feels like it's full, because sometimes it, you fool because if it just got you know some some water and it kind of filled those pods up, they feel a little bit swollen, but it's really not ready to be harvested, and those become wasted. So what would have been another you know a couple quarts or more of product, you end up throwing out because there's nothing in the pods. The pods look great, but what you have inside is pretty much nothing. So. Um, you know, just a quick glance up towards the sun, holding that before you harvest it, and it will tell you all everything you need to know uh, before you actually pull it and, you know, stop it from producing a larger size. So uh, you don't let the pods dry out. So when you notice the very bottom, it'll start drying out at the bottom. Uh, first, when you see pods that are dried out or kind of yellowing on the bottom, you make sure you pull those because the more dry pods that the plant has on it, the slower its production is going to be. It feels like its whole job is to go ahead and let these uh, pods grow, dry out, create seeds, and then it's done. So instead of you getting one more harvest in the season, you could actually be done earlier than expected because if there's enough dry bean pods that are popping open, it'll actually spread open and drop the beans out. Um, if there's enough of those, it will actually stop producing. It'll start slowing way down and stopping because it feels its job is done. So you want to go ahead and pull those off as you come to them. It's just worth a quick glance to see if you have anything dry way down on the bottom uh, to, to pull those off, you know, each time you come to them. So it's one of those, you'll, you'll, you can harvest more than once a week. Um, depending on how selective you are, or you can harvest once a week and actually get, for the most part, you can get everything you need. Uh, so when you're finished, you can definitely uh, store these unshelled beans. So if you put them in baskets or containers, uh, not zip, not like in a Ziploc bag, but open to the air, you can leave them a few days in a dry, cool place uh, before you shell them. Sometimes it actually, if you leave them for a day, 
they shell easier. Uh, so it might make sense to do, but you can sell these if you were looking to sell them at farmers markets or roadside stands or anything, you could sell them uh, unshelled. So people are used to buying them and shelling them on their own. Or if you're working a roadside stand, you may sit and shell them and sell them by the court uh, already shelled. And, and then you're talking about a higher uh, number. But I mean, it's not unreasonable for people to pay, uh, you know, $75, $80 a bushel uh, for unshelled beans, uh, 10 to $12 a quart for shell. So that's not something that, you know, people are uh, shy away from, at least in our area. So once they're shelled, you can store them in the refrigerator about a week. Um, then you can put them in a Ziploc bag if you like. Uh, then my recommendations, if you aren't gonna eat them soon and enjoy them, then maybe you go ahead and blanch and freeze them uh, or you can can them and that would last uh, for up to a year. So those who you know are liking the, the freezer and, and utilizing that, uh, my biggest problem is usually I try to hoard them a little bit. Like I'll, I don't wanna let them go to so special holiday meals or a couple meals. And then I notice when, when I'm getting ready to harvest again, I still have bags of, of uh, beans. Well, then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, trying to every meal gets lima beans because you know we're trying to use them up because we'll have more coming and we need those out of the way. But uh, it's just, a, I don't know if that's a personal thing or everyone does that, but it seems like when I, when I store, that's what I do. So with this, we have, you know, the lima bean pest link that's there. Um, here's just the gardening uh, know-how website, which is where I got the images for the, uh, the different diseases. But there's definitely some gardening tips on contending with those. Uh, so with that, there's our justice for all. Are there questions? And I will see if I can stop sharing so I can see the rest of the things. And that, there were some questions. Um, so thank you, John. And um, the first question was right when you were beginning. So I think you might have answered it. And uh, the person wanted to know where can you buy lima bean plants? Um, the person shared that they had wasted two bags of seeds but failed to, it to sprout either indoors or outdoors. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, the well, you can still buy plants. Um, I think Clark sells them uh, locally, you know, but you can get them. I think down in Sussex County, there is, uh, oh man, what is it? Something, what is the, something, no, whatever, something or other. Uh, man, now I can't draw, draw a blank on the, on the greenhouse. I don't know, but there is a, there is a couple places uh, that still sell them. And if you look on, you know, social media, people will put up that they had, you know, they, they started, 30 plants and they really only needed 10, but they weren't sure how their beans were gonna turn out. And then they end up with 10 or 15 plants uh, still available. Um, so that is a way to go. I mean, for me personally, we start seeds, um, you know, you just gotta make sure you don't overwater them. Uh, there is some sort of light uh, that keep that, you know, so they, they think that, you know, you're fooling them into believing that it's, it's time for them to get going and, and moving. Uh, I know you can germinate in darkness, but you really want them to start, as soon as they start growing, you wanna see some light in the mix. So I think that, you know, I don't know what happened, but those are probably some of the issues at hand, uh, maybe overwatering uh, being one of the biggest ones for people who start their own seeds. Uh, and then of course your seeds selection, I don't know if, you know, where you got your seeds or um, what happened with that, but yeah. So there, but I think that Clark still sells them. There's some people that you can actually inquire um, there's some farms that have greenhouses like uh, around here, the um, Amish, like Yoder's and different ones. You can actually request them if you, you, they'll start seeds for you as well. So if you have seeds that you, you kept and you want, you can take them to some of these greenhouses. They'll actually give you a price to start yours and get your seeds going as well. There was also a question about where to buy the Dr. Martin Fulbing uh, plants. Tricky, um, yeah. So. Again, Dr. Martin seeds are not really available. And so the only people who have Dr. Martin seeds are people who have been growing Dr. Martins and saving the seeds over time. So it isn't something that you can get anymore. So you'd sort of, you know, have to put a feeler out to see if you can 
uh, find somebody who has plants that they've started in that. And remember, they're going to be some sort of hybrid of. Uh, so they're, you know, this is something that it's open pollinated, it's self pollinated. So if someone's growing a couple different types in any kind of a, a close proximity, they are going to cross pollinate some. So the seeds get altered as time progresses, they become hybrids. So, you know, that's something that's going to become some of an issue. Um, the seed stores all recommend, you know, have seeds that they say are available, but they're not actually, you know, they're not commercially a viable Dr. Martin's, uh, you know, so some might say it, um, but they're, or they call it a different name, but you're looking for a decent uh, medium to large bean seed, and you probably will get something that, that is, you know, good for uh, what you're trying to do. But yeah, because real um, Martin's are no longer existing. We got some did. years ago. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, Debbie put in that vermontbean.com actually has Dr. Martin's on their website. I know that it is hard. And again, I think you're better to ask for the large seeded pole limas, you know, to even have a chance of getting some of them because they are harder to find now. Yeah, we used to grow a product called Prize Takers. Those were um, available and then they went through one year where it decimated their seed stock farms and all of a sudden they were just gone. But the funny thing is some of the seed companies call them still, they call prize takers and they call them these different things. And when you get them and you grow them because we were excited that they were existing again. Um, so we started them, we grew them and we went from something that was a, you know, a six to seven bean pod, uh, nine inches long to something that looked just like all the other standard medium bean seeds and that is not actually the prize takers that we were. It's just the name they adopted to sell yeah. the seed. So I just um, I clicked on that link that um, I think Michael put in the chat about that from Vermont, and yeah. it says at the bottom here: due to supply issues, we will not be receiving more of this variety of seed. If you are looking for a similar variety, please try one of these, and it links you to uh, King of the Garden. So, you yes. know, they're just yeah. really hard to find. Right. So King of the Garden is available. It's a smaller pod, smaller bean, um, and it is readily available because it has a long track record with multiple uh, seed farm sources. So they have been able to continue that one without fail. Uh, but when you start talking about these larger uh, bean seeds, the Martins and, and other prize takers and other ones that are in the mix, uh, those are the trickier ones because again, some of it's marketing, which I can't knock anyone for that. I mean, as a farm management specialist, I say marketing is key but you really have to be, it's buyer beware because they're not guaranteeing the genetics to be Dr. Martins. They just, someone told them they were Martins, they grew them, they had the seeds, they're doing it and they're selling it. I mean, they're not certifying anything. So buyer beware in that. But I mean, a large bean, if you get a large bean seed available, uh, that's a decent pod, uh, it, it, will, it will work. There's no way around that. If you like pole beans, they were great in our region. It's hilarious. When you get outside of our region, they sort of drop off significantly until you get to Florida. Um, so it, I don't know when people will not pay the prices they pay in Delmarva anywhere along the Northeast or down towards there until you get to Florida. So I don't know what it is. I guess it's very much a uh, regional uh, thing that people, you know, are, have grown up with them and are, are willing to pay because they know what the prices are and how much work goes into them. But once you get out of there, everyone else is like, why wouldn't you just go to the, the grocery store and pick up a bag? You know, that's the mentality is just totally different. I also feel uh, lima beans need a revamp in marketing. I think maybe a new name or something because they have definitely not been, you know, a, as marketable. Uh, other in our region, but I mean, out once you've broadened out uh, across the, beyond the mid-Atlantic to, to say, you know, you're, you're growing pole lima beans, most people are like, uh, lima beans, I don't like lima beans. You know, they have those experiences that aren't great uh, about them. So I don't know what we can do to market them, but I definitely would be interested in trying to come up with a new, uh, a new marketing campaign to get lima beans rolling. Uh, we do grow uh, Ford hooks, that are, which are commercial uh, variety that was developed here and and uh, everything, and they're great too. Uh, I'm a fan of I'm a fan of lima beans, apparently. But you know, as as a whole, they're you know it's good. But once you get out of this region, you get to California, they're growing them. We grow them, 
uh, it's definitely something that you, you don't see a lot of that through the middle. I think a lot of that has to do with kids eating canned limas, which are many of the seconds. They're not picked um, at the prime time either always because they're yep. buried when they mature. Yep. And I always tell people I grew up and um, growing them and eating them and actually did my master's degree in lima beans. <laughs> right. But but John is so right because this is like, it's like a, a little culture here in, on Delmarva in the mid-Atlantic area for people saving seeds and things like that and actually paying good money for them because right. I always tell people pole lima has the best flavor when it's harvested correctly. Yeah, I mean, and let's be honest. One of, my, one of my students said they hated lima beans. There was nothing about a lima bean they wanted. They wouldn't eat that. And so they, I said, look, just try one, man. They're delicious. And we're in the field harvesting them. He eats pot, he opens the pot, eats one and goes, all right, I like lima beans raw. I'm like, well, they're good raw, but <laughs> you, you know, I oh, mean- Lima it, corn and tomato soup is the best. It is awesome, <laughs> right? Mike is, Mike is not on, but uh, Mike makes a phenomenal, uh, you know, soup in that regards. And there is, you know, beans and dumplings and different things. But the problem a lot of people have is they do the soups that have that, there's more of that dried bean yes. uh, soup base. And then all of a sudden it's more of a, I don't know, I wouldn't call it chalky, but it definitely has a different texture than a fresh lima bean would. And, you know, so if that's what you think of when you eat a lima bean, a lot of people feel that it's just kind of draw, you know, if it's not in soup, it, it's kind of dry and sucks the moisture out of your, your, your mouth and stuff. That's not the way lima beans are that we're producing here but exactly. that's definitely something so i don't know again we need a marketing campaign get these babies going again because i think that the next generation's missing out uh if they're not going to participate in in eating lima beans fresh lima beans yeah mike also put up that roar seeds and and i just brought that up and it they do have dr martin's in packs of 10 seeds and there. is there any caption under them about the i don't think there was the other thing I would recommend, no, um, Lancaster County grown heirloom is what they're listing here, 90 days to harvest, so. Yeah, so, and of course, you know, they're, it's not, they're not from necessarily Lancaster, but that might be someone that's growing them. And if there is no one near him or her, and they're actually growing just their variety and doing, it will actually be close. You know, genetically speaking, it's going to be very close. Yeah, Fern Hill, Fern Hill Farms, um, probably 25 years ago, were, was a big source for Dr. Martin's, but they've gone out of business. So that was right. a big hit for that particular variety. They were out of New Jersey, but they were. Yeah. 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 Yep. yeah there, and there was a couple. I mean, prize takers actually came out of Jersey as well. Yeah. And I would say, I think somebody asked about. Um, if they're difficult sprouting, if you're planting them at the right time, not necessarily some of the bigger ones. If you're having trouble, I would start with King of the Garden just to get your feet wet because it's an easier one to grow. Um, it's been around forever. Um, but the larger beans, I used to buy the seconds from Fern Hill years ago and literally um, use wet paper towels and roll the seed in them, put them in a plastic bag and germ them that way. And you just can unroll them and take a look to be sure that that uh, root has emerged and then you could plant them in um, bigger uh, packs or cells and because they need that those bigger seeds need a bigger cell to grow into for yeah training. that's I guess I didn't mention that but that is true um, you want to make sure that um, you have a, a larger uh, pot or, or cup growing them because they can get root bound and then all of a sudden when they go to launch they kind of don't, you know, they, they are stunted. Um, and then you start seeing that when you go to transplant them, they're, they're root bound. So uh, you don't want to leave them in a tiny cell. You know, what, what works for some plants, uh, they need more room. Uh, and you end up transplanting them multiple times if you're not careful. You don't start with large enough pots. So. Yeah, making sure you have a great root system to go out, especially like John said, I mean, they can be finicky. So if it's, if it's windy and it's hot and dry and you're not watering, <laughs> it can be a, a big mess. Yes. Um, so, I mean, it, they're great. They do real well. Um, but there is years that even some of the people who have grown them for a long time have struggled. Um, they are definitely weather-based. You know, you can't stop extra moisture. Uh, no one can afford to put 
you know, sort of a, a you know, bows and plastic over them and only get the water they want them to have uh, on an acre of a, you know, of a pole bean variety. So it's not something that's completely controllable, but you definitely want to make sure you do what you can with it, you know, making sure it has water, but not over water. If you have the, the harder clay, you know, wet low land, see if there's somewhere else you can plant them because or they do want to them up. Well dried, you know, um, heal them up it works kind of, but sometimes it's problematic depending on where you're planting. Yeah, my father-in-law did the plant all the time in the same spot. I love him dearly, but we had a bust in the irrigation. He didn't see it. So you can get root rots, like John, you know, John says, once you have something planted over time. So you certainly wouldn't want to rotate with other snap beans or peas or things like that, that, you know, uh, they would, they would get the similar diseases. So that's, yeah, what guess, do. yeah, Tracy, you're right. I mean, some people rotate, but they rotate a similar crop into yeah. the area, which never breaks the cycle for the disease. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, so when they come back to it, it's still sitting right there and they say, why didn't this work? You know, and you realize that they put in very similar crop uh, families mm -hmm. into it that are still susceptible to the same diseases. You know, that's not going to break a cycle of anything. So I, I definitely will reiterate what you just said. You know, the, the average rotation is three years for diseases. But if you know you have a known root rot or something like that, mm -hmm. it would, you should really throw it out to four to five years. Five years. Come back and, in there, uh, yes. And because you're going to move this crop and leave it set up for a longer period of time anyway, it works out good for pole exactly. beans. You want to, you know, but again, you want to move these every four or five years. So that way, if there was an issue, should be gone if you broke the cycle and didn't put something back in the ground that's in its family. Yeah, but, definitely. Right. The other thing I will throw out there that um, when I did my research in, um, it, it was with Ford Hook, the large bush bean, lima okay. bean and then um, a baby seeded lima bean. And it goes back to where they originate. And um, the smaller seeded beans come from the hotter environments. Um, and then the, the larger seeded beans usually, in, at least in the bush beans came from the Andes mountains. So it was cooler, a lot of humidity, things like that. So it's important. But one thing that a lot of people, when, they, when it, we get real hot and dry, um, in July and in August, we'll have a hot spell. When it's over 95 degrees, the pollen is actually affected. So you're not going to get good pollination when we've had, you know, temperatures above 95. So that's, you know, and, but the joy of the polyma is that they continually set seed. So you might miss a spot, but, but when we get cooler weather, they'll, they'll start to set again. Yeah. And, and the other side of the coin is they will continue to produce a slowdown, but they will continue to produce yeah. Honestly, if you if you don't have a heavy frost, a killing frost, they will go till November, um, mm -hmm. and and you will still have product, uh, sort of the last thing in your garden you're battling with, uh, unless you put in some sort of, um, you know, fall crops that you're looking to to make even later into December. But yeah, they're they're one of the last things that they will continue to produce and do, uh, real well, you know, into the cooler times. They don't mind it once they're going. They don't love it when they're coming out of the ground and getting started, but they do uh, appreciate it as, as they're going. You know, you'll see that September is a great month for uh, pole beans and October is a great month for pole beans because it's cooled off a little bit and that's taken the edge off. The problem becomes the sun is less. So you start getting much slower uh, maturing rates. And so, you know, but it, you, you'll continue to get crop. So. And there was a, <laughs> Someone or confirmation might have been Michael um, about the spacing, um, yeah. a minimum of three foot spacing in a row and 10 feet between rows. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And, so that's, oh, go ahead. Definitely. That's, that's actually a critical piece um, to battle against some of the fungal issues. So, one, you don't want to plant too many, even King of the Garden. If you look at the pack of King of the Garden, I think it says one to two feet is the spacing within row. Um, you want to go at least three feet, right? Three feet between each plant or each seed. If you want to go direct seed, you can. You want to wait until the ground's a little warmer or it just will sit there and potentially stall out or rot. So you want to make sure you got warm enough ground for it to run with, even if you end up being a little later in the season. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you want that space between the rows, which again, back in the day, 
it was nothing to be four feet, five feet, just enough for you to kind of go through and, with a rototiller and walk through and harvest. But what we found is those tighter spacings left more problems with fungal issues because there's not enough airflow. Um, there was pollinating issues, there was uh, disease issues. Uh, so it creates a problem. They do want some sun to hit across the board and you do want to have that airflow. So yep, absolutely. Um, how many bean seeds uh, per hill? Well, typically you'd wanna do just a couple uh, in the mix to make sure that you don't have a problem if you had some that were skips. Uh, and it's kind of nice because when you do have more than one come up, you can actually transplant it in places that didn't have them uh, or expand. Some people, they just do sort of the one across the board, but then they do another hill where they plant some spares uh, at the end of the row that they expect if they had a problem, they can move those back in the mix. But um, yeah, you don't, it's not like the ones where you plant multiple uh, in every hill because then you got a whole lot of plants to figure out what you're gonna do with when you're done. And Tracy, you had a, a good suggestion for finding spider mites. Did you wanna share? Yeah, so spider mites are a warm season um, pest. So what happens, we normally see them on the oldest leaves. So they're gonna be at the bottom of the plant. So you'll always see that they'll run out of nitrogen or uh, first. So if anything yellows, it's gonna be those oldest leaves that have been on there all that time. But you can literally take, if you don't have a hand lens or a magnifier, you can literally take a white piece of paper, go under those leaves and tap the leaves onto the paper and the mites fall off and you can, you can see them scurrying <laughs> for that. So that makes it easier. Um, you can do sprays of water underneath them if you see that they're getting, or you could just remove those oldest leaves if you have an outbreak, you know, and you notice they haven't gone up higher into the plant. So that's always important, but John's right on the stink bugs. That's one of those things that once they pierce, you don't even see them, they pierce the pod, then they cause a, a darkening on the beans. So those, that's another one that's really important to watch for. And I yeah, also it all in, your fun when you when you harvest and you see all these yeah. great pods and then you open them up to find that half of them have been damaged. It kind of knocks the wind out of your sails, right? I mean, yes. you, you kind of worked hard to get them and then you open them up and you're like, what? You know, so yeah, stink bugs is definitely the enemy of our state of the, uh, you know, crop of pole beans. For yeah. sure. I also put in the Dios weather station. And this is, if you look under there, there's weather stations all across the state of Delaware. We're actually blessed to be, we're, we're the highest number of weather stations in the country for us, you know, as far as number of um, closely related um, stations and it um, tracks weather daily. So you can look on there and look for soil temperature. Cause like John said, you know, if someone had trouble and they were, I don't know when someone put, they were having trouble with germinating. Um, if you wait till the soil is 65, 64, 65 degrees, because this is, you know, they'll germ in cooler weather, but it's going to take longer. So then Very they fun. will pop out, yeah. of the, out of the ground quicker. And if you aren't sure, you can go on that weather station, find your, the one closest to where you live, and you can get that information. Yeah, that's the, the, the sort of the blessing for the black plastic mulch. Yes. Um, is it, it actually will rocket ship your uh, your bean germination and growth uh, again great in the spring not so great in August you know in July late July and August because then all of a sudden you're creating a heat buildup underneath but you're just hoping that you have enough shade coming from the, the mass of the bean stalks that it actually doesn't affect the bottom as much but um, that's sort of the, the basis we use and it, it works well but it definitely it, there is a, some sort of a relationship uh, there. But we like the black because if you're going to get things started in the spring, that will let Absolutely. you jump that ground temperature up and get things started very quickly. And usually that first harvest, the first set of beans that you have are the most productive. It's not that they stop, but you get that the biggest part of your crop normally, yeah. unless we have high heat spells. But that's, yeah, I love my lima beans. <laughs> And then we had another question about, um, do you have any suggestions for home gardeners? And I think you've come up with, you know, a whole bunch, but anything else you can think, you know, just, um, just for the small home gardener. So if you, I mean, I still, I like the trellis system that we kind of use, but I do know that some home gardens like to use a TP style. I didn't pitch that out because it's really 
Um, we've done it, um, but it's not not my favorite. Uh, it's hard to harvest. It, it leaves an issue on the inside where the mass becomes uh, something that you don't see the bugs and pests. You don't see the fungal issues until it spreads through and out. I mean, so there's an opportunity to incubate bad things. Um, but there is that. I mean, some people, they like to just use a few three posts TP style and, and wire or netting and, and they just run up it. But uh, yeah, I mean, even if you have a small garden, I still recommend, you know, sort of, if you had 20 feet, you just set up one set. And if you have room to put a second row, put another row. My dad's been growing these things for years. He used to grow, you know, six, eight rows, 10 rows, depending on the year. Now he grows one. And it, because that's all the room he has. Sold the farm, moved in town, puts in one row, you know, and then it moves it around as necessary, but you have a small backyard, what do you do? But he still puts in and deals with the same setup, you know, that we've been pitching for, you know, when we had lots of them versus where he has the small amount now. Uh, difference is, you know, he doesn't use drip irrigation with a, a header hose, he's using uh, soaker hoses and stuff, you know, but some of that, you know, that, that actually, you know, there's no, as long as you're getting the, the basics done uh, for water, nutrition, and light and air, I mean, really, you're, you're good to go. Some crops, sweet corn and thing, do better when there's multiple rows. Um, this is probably not one of them. It, it can do just as well standalone as it can with five rows. So, I mean, it is something that, you know, as long as you're taking care of it, it's getting the basic needs, it'll do well. There you go. Something Tracy just put back up. Yeah, for, um, for this is, I'm not supporting growers um, um, supply, but they have the white nylon uh, yep. trellising netting that John talked about. I think I've also seen it in tractor supply in your local uh, yeah. tractor supply. You can find it sometimes too. That's very nice yeah. for holding, yeah. holding yeah. those vines together. And right. The problem is from like Johnny Select Seeds and some of the places that you buy it, it comes in, you know, I don't know, Rolls. a thousand foot roll. Uh, yeah, or like, four thousand, I think maybe it was four thousand foot row yeah. when we bought them last time. Uh, so, you know, it might be enough to last you a lifetime if you bought one roll. But yeah, so if you could get some of the smaller amounts yeah. uh, and shorter netting sets, it's good. But you do want them to be tall enough. You want them to be, you know, six feet tall, uh, you know, to, to let them spread out and, and, and trellis. So you want them to be basically as high as you can reach. Um, is where you kind of want them to be. And I think you've answered this question, but it was about tr uh, tricks or, or suggestions for getting them to sprout. But I think you've kind of gone over that. Yeah, I mean, I guess Tracy's is a good one. If, if you really are struggling to get them to germinate, so you don't know if it's something you're doing or is it the, be the beans themselves, right? Right. Uh, because depending on where you got the beans and how old they are and lots of things, how they were stored, um, in, in where they left to get hot. I mean, there's a lot of problems if it killed the cotyledon in them. So if you just take uh, wet paper towels and I mean, you can even lay like 10 on a, on a paper towel and then, and then you cover it with another paper towel and you leave it wet. When you see them sprout and start break, and then you transplant yes, the them then. The little tiny root start yep. to come out. That's when you can put them in. Yep, it'll just things. bust in open a little bit that you can, you can move them into some soil and uh, then you should probably be able to be well on your way uh, to solving that issue. I mean, because there's a lot of things that can go wrong, one of them being the seeds. I mean, like we've planted seeds that were five years old and still got, I don't know, 75, 80% germination rate, but they were stored properly. But if somebody doesn't store them properly, even year old seeds can become dead and not functioning. So. It might be something you were doing, it might not be. I mean, the truth is it could have been the right. seed stock, how it was stored, um, maybe it was harvested green and then they try to dry it out, doesn't work well. Um, you really want them to dry out on the vine as, as best you can or picked and dried out and then left and then harvest, you know, cracked open and stored after. Um, but there's a lot of things someone could have done wrong in the seed mm -hmm. or you could have overwatered and, and killed it, you know, where it just rotted out. But I mean, I think that that would be the trick. I think that, you know, Tracy's little trick with the paper, wet paper towels can go a long way. Well, that, I was being cheap too, because Dr. Martin's were really expensive. So I would buy the seconds and then yeah. I just got rid of those that weren't any good. 
and, back and planted the ones that were, were. So yeah, so that's an back easy. Back then question. they were cheap, comparable. Yeah, compared to now. Yeah. Right. You know. The other the other tidbit I have, um, and I have childhood memories of this, is we would grow a lot of whole limas at home. We would shell lima beans at night while we watch TV. <laughs> yeah, a whole family. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, absolutely. That, that was nothing. Eat a few raw ones. Now yep. there is. I don't know. I didn't mention. I guess there is a run or a rumor or whatever you know that that lima beans are tied to arsenic um i guess the truth of the matter is after testing they they there there is a trace of yeah. natural arsenic built into these um but not enough to actually hurt anyone so i mean but i'll put that out there that you know if you heard that i mean it, it is a, it is a not it's not false it's true but it is not poisoning based it is just happens to be it was something when they were designed and bred that it kind of you know picked up and drawn into them so i don't know but I would, i'll put that out there not to turn people away from them I'm, yeah. nothing's happened to me and trust we, me we, we wouldn't sell somebody, them if if it was something that was going to yeah. hurt somebody that's going to hurt them it would do but it, i would be a fine example i couldn't be here if i was uh you know, me too. I, eat, I eat enough <laughs> lima beans that it, it would take me out if that was the case but i will throw it out there is something that people put out there um, you'll see it on, on the, the social medias and you'll see it out there. Um, so it's true, but such a minute amount that it's not actually a nervous type situation. It's not something that can affect you. Uh, There's one should, final question about, should you chop up the shells before composting? Depends on how fast you want it to compost. Yeah, they'll <laughs> break down. I don't, I don't know if I'd worry about that. I mean, it, you know, that once the moisture comes out of them and they go through a heat, I mean, you'll, they, they'll become little to nothing pretty quick i always like to say compost happens we just decide whether we want to speed it up or not <laughs> and the smaller the pieces the easier they'll break down yeah i mean i'm a big component of airflow so if i want my compost to go faster you create more heat for your air um to go i don't know i mean i go through the effort to chop them up but that, that, that's and there were people who wrote down um in the chat box that uh, to thank you and to say that they are now going to start um, growing lima beans. So perfect. <laughs> Good. Someone's inspired to grow. What are we going to call these things? I want a new name, lima beans. But you know, people think that they're foreign, right? Lima, Peru. I don't know, but it's it, you know, it's definitely something that we need to to keep going and keep moving forward. But I appreciate it. Thanks everyone for sitting through it. And um, I'd like to have a little parting word, if you don't mind, everybody. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody who participated and always our presenters, our assistants, and of course you, our participants in our first ever um, series that we've done like this. We'll probably do one again next spring. It has proved to be um, pretty time consuming putting it all together. So we're gonna have a little break next spring. We'll, we'll take this up again. Uh, so please let us know, give us your feedback on the evaluations or send an email. If you have any suggestions of what kind of series you'd like to see in the future. And I know I've seen a lot of people say that they would like more vegetables. So if there's any vegetables that you're particularly interested in learning about, um, let us know that too, so that we can start planning ahead and get ready to give you what you want uh, in the next round. Um, so uh, thank you, everybody. And um, do you have anything else out there, John, Tracy, for us? Don't forget to do your evaluation. That's what pays right. And I put the uh, link in the chat box, but if you don't have time to do it right now, the evaluation link will also be in the email that I'm going to send you shortly as soon as I get all the resources together for everybody. Yeah, and if people have other questions, just give our garden help line or one of us a call. We'd be happy to help you with it. Yep. We're here for you. how to get a hold of me, so I'm around. Thank Somebody you very just suggested much. lima beans, the other white bean. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should give out recipes and, you know, that kind of thing so people learn to love them. <laughs> That's yeah, I always tell good. people you haven't had the right kind. That's right. Everyone, everyone holds their soup recipes as a secret, but I, let's be honest, we should put a few of those out there because I think that if people realize some corn, some tomatoes, and and some lima beans, or even some of the dumpling recipes. Oh yeah, um, they would they would find them to be 
uh, you know. It's all about when the beans are harvested. If you don't yeah. harvest them at the right time. Yeah. yeah. Bitter. Yeah. yeah, you don't want to go where they're bitter. That's true. Yeah. Awesome. Well, if you have any good recipes, guys, Tracy or John, um, send me links or information and I'll send it out to people with the follow up. Okay, cool. They're asking for recipes, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I can do that. Now, unfortunately, it's just sort of this throw together thing. But yeah. I'll, 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 I'll try to put that down on paper. Awesome. Thanks, guys.